Well, good morning to the church family. We treasure these times when we get to have the whole family together all at once. Looks like God has uh, served us up a big bouquet of flowers this morning. And some of us get to even sit under a big fragrant pink canopy. So a lot of times in the wintertime, I look out the window and everything is so stark and bare and brown and ugly. And I just remember this too shall pass. There will come a day when this tree looks like this again. So, <laughs> All right. Well, we are going to uh, keep moving our story along in the book of Nehemiah. And so if you want to go there in your Bibles, if you want to fire them up on your phone or open your hard copy, we'll be in chapter 2 this morning. I am wondering, uh, did any... Did anybody not get the text, or are you not on the, the group text? Because if you would like to be a part of the mass texting communication of this church, we just need you to fill out a communication card and give us the number and name, and uh, we can include you so that you can get live up-to-date information on any changes to our worship service or other things going on in the church family. But uh, as we come back to uh, the book of Nehemiah, uh, it's really a beautiful story about how a wrecked city that was really wrecked got rebuilt. And how God used this sweet servant named Nehemiah to bring revival to the inhabitants of that city. And, And Nehemiah didn't even live in that city. He was a royal attendant of the Persian king, but he got a really bad report about how the Jews were doing who had returned to the Holy Land after the Babylonian captivity. And even though some of the exiles had already made their way back to the Jewish homeland some 90 years earlier, he found out that the city was still in this terrible, rundown condition, and that the people were without walls and gates to protect them, which left them constantly vulnerable to raiders and exposed to all sorts of dangers. And so the city was sparsely populated at the time, because without that security, you really can't get traction to begin flourishing and thriving again as a community. And so here you have the holy city called by God's name. It hasn't come really come back to life again. And so God really isn't being glorified from the very place where he was meant to be most magnified back then. And to Nehemiah, that's a problem. And so he enters into this very intense season of prayer and fasting And he seeks God for a way to go back and be of real help to God's household and just get their city life back on track so they can do what God called them to do, and that's be his glorifiers in this earth and fulfill their unique calling as a chosen nation that was to be a light to all the other nations. So months and months of praying finally kind of lead to the day of God answering. And that's where we find ourselves in the story in chapter 2, verse 1 through 8. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been sad in his presence, and the king said to me, Why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should my face not be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, what are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven and I said to the king, if it pleases the king and if your servant has found favor in your sight that you send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, 
If it pleases the king, let letters be given to me to the governors of the province beyond the river, that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked, for the good hand of my God was upon me. So the day comes when the king notices a dejected look on Nehemiah. And so the king kind of starts to pry in a little bit and pull out of Nehemiah whatever's going on inside of him. And and Nehemiah gives the king a really delicate answer here when he talks about the place of my father's graves lying in ruins. You know, there's really nowhere else in the book where that's really the big rally cry for rebuilding the city. Let's Do it for the father's graves, right? But he's bringing that reason out right now with the king. And I think here's what you have going on is that Nehemiah has to be extra careful here. He wants to avoid giving any impression to the king that they want to fortify the city of Jerusalem again in hopes that it might regain its independence and come out from under the Persian control of that region, right? Because if the king suspects any kind of sneaky, treasonous plot like that, uh, that could be the end of Nehemiah's life. And so I think that partly explains why Nehemiah said, I was very much afraid. And so he gives the king what I like to call a secondary reason for why he wishes the city could be fully reconstructed again. And probably a reason that the king could sympathize with because the king would have his own ancestral dead and he would care about the look and condition of their burial place too. And so this is when the king invites Nehemiah to just come out with what it is he wants and say his request. And so all this praying has now built up to this suspenseful moment here where either Nehemiah is going to chicken out or he's going to step out with some courage in his God. Because, you know, we can pray in faith and we can pray in faith and pray in faith and pray in faith and pray in faith, but there has to come a moment and a decisive moment when we actually step out in faith and take some kind of risk for the kingdom when we put ourselves out there for God in a way that maybe leaves us a little bit more vulnerable where we're really needing God to be in it with us or it could go very badly for us. And so he's about to ask the king for a crazy favor, like an out-of-the-box, big, bold ask that a normal cupbearer to the king should not be asking. If you just want to go with the uh, expected etiquette of the time. And just before he does that, what does he do? He says, I pray to the God of heaven. That's a bullet prayer. He kind of fires up a real fast bullet prayer. And here's what I'm going to say is that bullet prayers are most effective when they are backed up by poured out times of prayer. All right, God knows that if we're going to walk with him, there's going to be those times when we pray those quick, fast, in the heat of the moment prayers. But we want those prayers, I call them popcorn prayers, to be supported by lengthier times of poured out prayer so that we are not lacking in spiritual power with our God, because we've created space to be with our God in a more unhurried way. And that's what we see has been going on all along in chapter 1 when he entered that season of prayer and fasting. And so then he fires up that bullet prayer. But he's asking the king for a favor. He wants the king to do three things for him. One, he wants the king to give him this really long leave of absence. It's probably going to be measured in years, not months. Have you ever tried asking your boss for that? (laughs) And then he wants the king to give him these royal royal letters of authorization 
for the governors of the Trans Euphrates region, right? That would be kind of west of the Euphrates River, closer to the homeland as you start to get near to the old neighborhood. And Nehemiah knows that those guys could give him a hard time. So he wants some official correspondence, letting those guys know that the king is sponsoring this and they need to keep their hands off Nehemiah and let him through. And by the way, that actually is a request to reverse an earlier royal decree by the Persians to stop reconstruction on the walls of the city. And you can read about that in the book of Ezra. And then he's asking that the king fund the project and pay for the whole thing out of his own lumber yard. Now, why would the king say yes to that? He says, for the good hand of my God was upon me. That's why the king said yes to that. The king said yes to that because the king of kings had already said yes to that. And the king of kings can influence the heart of any other king. And so Nehemiah sees the hand of God in his circumstance in that way. And he kind of skips the details of the journey. And he kind of cuts right to the part where he's beginning to get back closer to the homeland. We'll pick it up in verse 9. Then I came to the governors of the province beyond the river, and I gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent with me officers of the army and horsemen, but when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the Ammonite servant heard this, it displeased them greatly that someone had come to seek the welfare of the people of Israel. So apparently not everybody's happy. That help is on its way for the Jews. And right away we are introduced to some adversaries. And whoever these guys are, they are going to become a major scaremongering force that Nehemiah and the Jews will have to contend with for the rest of the story. But right now you're just kind of seeing them briefly. It's kind of like when you watch a movie, right? You know, it's like a, a horror movie. Okay, I don't really want you watching horror movies. But you watch a thriller or some scary movie, and, and, and you know, nothing bad has happened yet, right? The antagonist hasn't attacked the protagonist yet in the film. But they kind of want you to know that's coming. You know, maybe it's like the family that's going to have this wonderful weekend in the woods, and then they're going to encounter, you know, that that mythical, mystical creature that's going to start picking them off one by, one by one. So this is the scene, right, where the family's just pulled up to the campsite and the kids are running around picking berries and can we swim in the lake and the parents are unloading the cooler and setting up the tent and then the camera pans over to the edge of the woods into some thick bushes and there's some rustling going on and some scary movement and you know that there's some dark sinister force in there but it hasn't done anything yet. But it's spying on the family, and later on in the movie, it's going to come out and attack. Okay, that's, what's, that's what this scene is. That's what this scene is. And who these guys are, we're not given a lot of detail about these guys. But this much we know. Their names come up in association with those royal letters being handed out to the governors of the trans-Euphrates region. So I think that's probably exactly who some of these people are. They are either governors or they're leading officials of other people groups in that area, chief administrators who represent other local powers. And they like seeing the Jews kept in a down and out condition. That's probably best for their own political ambitions or their own economic agenda, and now they feel very threatened by somebody who has just shown up on the scene to empower the Jews and raise them back up again. And so I just want us to pause here. You know, the church is a threat to the world sometimes. It's a threat to the world because when you have people who have built their life on darkness they stand to lose something when the kingdom of God moves forward and begins to expand its influence. 
They stand to lose something when biblical truth takes hold in the popular imagination. Right? They, they resent the church showing up to rescue girls from sex trafficking because that cuts deep into their profits. They don't like the church holding up God's created order for sexuality and marriage and gender because that interferes with the massive social experiment they're conducting on kids in the name of these new ideals. Maybe the government doesn't want the gospel spreading to its citizens because it upsets the cultural identity that's been built around the worship of another god. Or a family doesn't appreciate it when another family member converts to Christ because they might not participate in the ancestral worship anymore. And who's going to venerate mom and dad once they go into the afterlife? And certainly there's a lot of people who feel very threatened by the pro-life efforts of the church that disrupt the lifestyle the sexually immoral lifestyle of many who count and rely on abortive services to empower a fornicating way of life and clean up the consequences of that. But guys, they're, they're, the church is just going to make the world feel threatened at time. And, and you know what? That's okay. That's okay. It's, it's not a sign that something's wrong. It's actually a sign that something's right. That light is advancing against darkness and that there are kingdoms that are clashing and in conflict down here. But more than anything, you know why the world you know why the world feels threatened by the church is because the world feels threatened by Jesus. Jesus threatens the world's love of darkness. Because Jesus means you have to change. So at last, Nehemiah arrives, verse 11. So I went to Jerusalem and was there three days. Then I arose in the night, and I and a few men with me, and I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. There was no animal with me but the one on which I rode. I went out by night by the valley gate to the dragon spring and to the dung gate, and I inspected the walls of Jerusalem that were broken down and its gates that had been destroyed by fire. Then I went on to the fountain gate and to the king's pool, but there was no room for the animal that was under me to pass. I went up in the night by the valley and inspected the wall, and I turned back and entered by the valley gate and so returned. And the officials did not know where I had gone or what I was doing, and I had not yet told the Jews, the priests, the nobles, the officials, and the rest who were to do the work. So Nehemiah goes out under the cover of night to inspect the situation. He's not ready to attract a bunch of attention to what he's there for yet. He's not ready to start answering a bunch of questions about that. This is just Nehemiah doing his homework and just getting a handle on how big this problem is, how bad the situation is. So he knows firsthand, up close and personal, what he's going to be calling the rest of that community to do. And he makes a really golden comment here that I want to draw your attention to. It's right there in verse 12. He says, I told no one what my God had put into my heart to do for Jerusalem. So what my God had put into my heart. My God putting into my heart. Okay, nowhere in the story of Nehemiah are you ever told that at least that from my reading of it that the word of the Lord came to Nehemiah you know you really don't get that in the story or you know God explicitly said to Nehemiah such and such and so and so or sent a prophet to him who said and thus saith the Lord go and rebuild the city of like, you don't get that in this story it's more a story of the inward leading of God and you know, Nehemiah didn't ever get a clear directive from God in any kind of immediate sense, but Nehemiah still found his way into the will of God for his life. And he still did the very works of God that God purposed for him to do. 
And guys, that's how it is for most of us. Most of us don't get a direct word from God, although sometimes we do, about what direction I'm supposed to go or this specific thing I'm supposed to be doing or what career path I'm supposed to be choosing or what location I'm supposed to be living in or where and how I'm supposed to be serving. And that doesn't mean that God's leading is absent from our life. God's leading is written all over this story without Nehemiah ever getting a thus saith the Lord directly from the Lord. So let's just look at what, play, you know, if I was to ever do a series on decision making and the will of God, I would want to come to the book of Nehemiah because of what variables you see playing out in how he found his way into God's customized path for his own life. What does it start with? It starts with Nehemiah delighting to fear God's name. That's what he says about himself and others in verse 11 of chapter 1, that this is a man who delighted himself in God, and so God laid a good desire upon his heart. And as he carried out that desire, it took him right into God's will for his life. It led him right into God's personal leading for his own life. Now, that's not the only thing that's at play. So you have that. You have a man delighting himself in God. You have a good desire stirring in his heart. Does that desire contravene? contradict the clear teaching from the Bible? Well, we know it doesn't, right? Nehemiah mentions in his prayer, God, there are promises that you have made in your word about this, regathering the Jews to the Holy Land and restoring them once again, if ever they were to be exiled. So we know that this desire actually uh, complements the general revealed word of God. So we have those three things going on. Then we see that Nehemiah made those desires the topic of much prayer. Then we also see that Nehemiah pulled other praying saints into those desires. You see that in verse 11 of chapter 1. So it's not just Nehemiah all up inside his own head, but it's Nehemiah who's also drawing other people into those desires and getting them to prayerfully process those desires with him. And then lastly, we see Nehemiah doing what? Stepping out in faith and actually acting on those desires and looking for God's confirmation, God's hand of confirmation in his external circumstances. Right? Are the right people made willing who have to be made willing? Are the doors of opportunity opening? Are the right pe- pieces coming into, into place that have to come in to place? And you know what? Without ever getting a clear directive from God, those things paved the path for Nehemiah to accomplish a great feat of faith that had God's name written all over it. And I'm going to submit to you today that a lot of God's leading in your life is just that very thing. The Word of God gives you permission to pay attention to the desires that are stirring in your heart if, if, if you are delighting yourself in Him. Now, if you're not delighting yourself in Him, if you're delighting in sin, or you're delighting in worldliness and you're just lost in your hobbies or focused on making a bunch of money or I'm just here to have the most fun all the time, flitting from one joy thing to the next. No. But if you are delighting yourself in him, you have permission from God to pay attention to those desires that are stirring in your heart and to understand that, no, I don't give those desires final ultimate authority over everything, but I do pay attention to them because they could be a big clue, a big hint into how God is taking me into those works he prepared beforehand for me to do in Christ Jesus. And I want us to, I'm going to stop here in the story, and I want us to go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. 
Second Thessalonians chapter one, verse 11. And what we find here is a, a prayer that Paul prays for the church at Thessalonica. Verse 11, to this end, we always pray for you. All right, now listen closely, that our God may make you worthy of his calling and may fulfill every resolve for good. Okay, a lot of your translations read every desire for good or every good desire and every work of faith by his power so that the name of our Lord Jesus may be glorified in you and you and him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love this prayer because this prayer assumes something to be going on in the hearts of God's people. Good desires. It assumes that there are Resolves for good, desires for good, stirring in the hearts of God's people. That if they carry those desires out to completion, will bring glory to Jesus Christ. And so that's what Paul's prayer is. That God would bless those desires and fulfill them. And bring them to fruition, to put his power to them so they can come to a place of full expression. And that Jesus Christ could be glorified through them. Hear this again. The word of God gives you permission to pay attention to the desires that are stirring in your heart for him when you are delighting yourself in who God is. So just you look at a few considerations straight from the book of Nehemiah. Do those desires contradict or do they complement the clear teaching in God's word? Are we committing those desires to God in prayer? Number two, is the faith community being given a chance to join you in praying about those desires and even giving you some feedback about those desires? desires and then number four as we act upon those desires in faith we are looking for an outward leading from God that complements the inward leading of God where his hand of confirmation is seen in those external circumstances and those were the variables that were at play in this amazing story that took a man into a work that God prepared and purposed for him to do, probably from before the foundation of this world. And I submit to you that a lot of decision-making and the will of God in your own life follows the same course that we see going on in this, in this story.